If you neglect to cultivate your inherent mindfulness and wisdom, striving only half-heartedly, the obstacles in your path will multiply until they block all sight of the way, leaving the end of the road forever in darkness. Failings of the Spirit Ajahn Kampan was the inspiration behind the Pugao monastic community. It was his responsibility to guide the nuns in their daily practice. This meant frequent contact with the woman renunciants, meeting them as a group, listening to their experiences and grievances, and giving them personal advice on a variety of matters. His age and senior status seemed to preclude the development of worldly attachments between him and the women he taught. But alas, the weaknesses of the flesh and failings of the spirit. A small group of nuns was left behind when Machi Gao and the others moved to Nokraba Cave. During their absence, Ajahn Kampan, with careless disregard for his status as a spiritual mentor, became emotionally involved with one of the remaining nuns. Although his samadhi meditation allowed him to observe and examine the circumstances of other living beings, Ajahn Kampan had neglected to contemplate and penetrate the true nature of his own being by failing to properly cultivate the faculties of insight and wisdom. He neglected to follow a fundamental tenet of the Buddha's teaching. He did not thoroughly investigate the aggregates of body and mind to see that they are wholly transient, unsatisfactory, and devoid of personal essence. In the deep meditative absorption of samadhi, body and mind merge into a single conscious unity, the mind's essential knowing nature, pure and simple, still and silent. This convergence gives rise to a feeling of pure and harmonious being so wondrous as to be indescribable and so perfectly pleasurable that it may become addictive. But, regardless of how sublime their experience is, these states of meditative absorption are still defiled by the presence of craving, anger, and delusion. Samadhi experiences of this kind will be no more than mundane in nature, and the spiritual insights gained from them will result in mundane wisdom still tainted by those defiling influences. A mind simplified and unified by samadhi becomes very deep clear, and powerful. Only by directing this focus to the practice of contemplation can true transcendent wisdom be attained. A profoundly insightful investigation of the body, feelings, and the mind can uproot afflictions of craving, hatred, and delusion, thus realizing the ephemeral and empty nature of all phenomena, eliminating craving, and achieving freedom from the cycle of repeated birth and death. Concentration and wisdom must work together propelling meditation toward its goal like the two wheels of a cart. The calm and concentration of samadhi enables wisdom to reach and remove deep-seated defilements through the use of specialized contemplative techniques. By uprooting these perversions, wisdom, in turn, deepens meditative calm. Thus, concentration and wisdom work in tandem to guide the meditator along the Buddha's path to enlightenment. Emerging from the sublime calm and concentration of samadhi, Ajahn Kampan withdrew no further than the access gate to the vast external world of spiritual energies. Instead of using Samadhi's sharp and clear internal focus to investigate the truth about his own being and his attachment to the physical and mental components that comprised it, he turned his attention outward to the world of subtle conscious energy fields. Because he did not use liberating wisdom to develop defenses against his baser instincts, he remained subject to sexual craving and thus gripped by the sensual bonds of deluded existence. By the time Mechi Gao returned from Nokraba Cave, Ajahn Kampan's infatuation with one of the junior nuns was becoming apparent. But, because of his senior leadership position in the community and his excellent reputation, the monks and nuns did not dare to reproach him for his indiscretions. Quietly, in private consultations, it was hoped that the affair would soon wane and come to an end. So, Ajahn Kampan's sudden announcement that he and the junior nun were giving up the robes and returning to lay life as a married couple caused shock and dismay. Mechi Gao was saddened by his unexpected departure and disappointed by his failure to live up to the trust that she and the other nuns had placed in his guidance. By that time, the nuns had lived and practiced under his tutelage for nearly eight years. His disrobing not only created an unpleasant scandal in the monastery, but also left a vacuum of monastic leadership, which forced the nuns to consider relocating as soon as possible to a more suitable environment. 
Suddenly, the nuns' spiritual leadership became their own responsibility. Mechi Dang and Mechi Ying convened a nuns-only meeting, which quickly reached a consensus that they should return to their home village immediately and seek a convenient location to establish a monastic community strictly for women. With that goal in mind, Mechi Gao and six other nuns moved to Ban Hui Sai in the spring of 1945. Aware of the nuns' sudden hardship and sympathetic to their plight, two prominent village elders became their patrons and presented them with twenty acres of farmland located about a mile south from the village center. Situated higher than the surrounding rice fields, the soil had been used for generations to plant cash crops, such as cotton, hemp, and indigo. However, a large portion of the land was covered with tangled stands of bamboo and towering hardwood trees, which afforded the nuns adequate seclusion to pursue their spiritual lifestyle undisturbed. The nuns graciously accepted the men's generosity and immediately set to work constructing a forest nunnery. With the help of men and women from Ban Hui Sai, thick patches of undergrowth were cleared to build temporary bamboo shelters. Bamboo sleeping platforms were constructed by splitting sections of bamboo lengthwise, spreading them out flat, then securing them to a bamboo frame with legs, creating a raised sleeping surface of about six feet long, three or four feet wide, and about one and a half feet above the ground. The roofs were thatched with bundles of tall grass that grew abundantly in the surrounding area. One thatched hut was constructed for each nun, and each hut was spaced as far apart from the others as the living area inside the nunnery would allow. Local villagers helped the nuns create paths for walking meditation beside each of their simple huts. A small but sturdy sala was built in a wide, open area that had previously been cultivated. Wooden posts and planks were sawed and trimmed, then nailed into place with wooden pegs to form the basic structure. The roof was a plain grass thatch. A kitchen shelter for preparing meals was constructed nearby, using split bamboo and thatch. An earthenware wood-fitted stove was used for cooking. Basic living requisites were scarce. The nuns used bamboo to make cups and other basic kitchen utensils. As there were no wells on the property, water from a nearby stream was fetched daily and carried to the nunnery compound. Basic commodities, such as shoes, were not available to the nuns, so they used dried beetle nut husks to make primitive sandals. Machetes, hoes, and shovels were also hard to come by, forcing the nuns to borrow most of their tools from the village. But, although Mechi Gao and the nuns lived in conditions of virtual poverty, they lived for the sake of Tamma and were willing to accept the inconveniences associated with its practice. The Banhui Sai nunnery was small and remote from village life. The training rules were strict and simple. Its living conditions allowed little that was fancy or superfluous. The nuns spent their days in meditation. Every evening they convened in the main sala. Seated respectfully on the hard wooden floor, in a building without comfort or decoration, they chanted sacred verses praising the virtues of the Buddha, Tamma, and Sangha. Mechi Gao often said that it was much easier to put up with the physical hardships of life as a nun than to be without a good teacher to guide her through the spiritual uncertainties experienced in meditation. The bitter disappointment of seeing a Dan Kampan succumb to the power of sensual lust hung like a heavy weight over Mechi Gao's heart. She was seized by a nagging need to understand why meditation had failed to protect him from ordinary base desires. She found herself grappling with thoughts full of doubt and disquiet. Was her own meditation going in the right direction? Had she overlooked an essential element? Pondering these questions, but lacking answers, she decided that she must search for a truly qualified teacher. As the two senior-most nuns, Mechi Dang and Mechi Ying, were responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the nunnery. With their sympathy and their blessings, Mechi Gao parted company with a group of women she had lived with for eight years, and left the newly established nunnery to fulfill her mission. Following the rains retreat, and traveling with a junior nun as a companion, Mechi Gao climbed into the Pupan foothills north of Ban Hui Sai, and continued to hike north along foot trails over tall mountains and through wide valleys, until she reached a Jan Gongma Chitapunyo's forest monastery, high in the easternmost Pupan range.